welcome to Occult Experiments in the Home, Magic, Spirituality and the Paranormal in Personal Experience and in Practice. It's mid-September and this is the beginning of a phase of the year that although I love it in many ways, in one particular way I hold it in dread because it's that time of the year in the UK when spiders emerge from their hiding places in order to find a mate. And although spiders in the UK aren't as large and certainly nowhere near as threatening or poisonous as other parts of the world, nevertheless their appearance is problematic to me because for the whole of my life I've had a dreadful phobia of them. I suspect it might be the same for anyone who has a phobia of anything. But whenever a spider above a certain size appears, I become possessed by a feeling of absolute revulsion and helpless fear. And I'm aware that it's completely irrational. This little thing isn't going to hurt me. Yet somehow, everything that's wrong with the world, or could possibly be wrong with the world, becomes embodied by this little creature that, of course, just like me, is just a living organism going about its business in the world. And yet what I'm experiencing is a sense that this creature before me is the manifestation of ultimate wrongness and of evil <laughs> because it seems to me in that moment that this creature appears precisely to torment me with its hideousness that that's its intention that it has designs on me that it means me harm this is all utter nonsense of course it is but the feelings the experience of it is real in that moment. There's no control over it and there's no knowledge either of why these feelings are being triggered or where they're coming from. For me, the form of a spider, the appearance of a spider, is confrontation with the inescapable fact that nature, that reality itself, can be full of things that are wrong and twisted and ugly beyond comprehension. The only way i found to deal with this is a brute force use of rationality. I just ride out the feelings by reminding myself that a spider is just a spider and my feelings are just feelings and just because I feel something it doesn't mean it's true. What is troubling perhaps is that if I think about my reaction to actual atrocities in history, in current world events, the revulsion I fear that those seems nowhere near as fierce and visceral and intense and direct. Now, my mother has a similar phobia, and I imagine that seeing... At an early age, my mother, in a state of abject terror at the appearance of a spider, probably didn't do much to help me develop a different attitude. Could it be that my fear of spiders originates in dimly remembered experiences and lines of thinking that once seem to suggest a spider must be something fearful and dangerous? Certainly there's a sense that it's imbued with something terrifying that doesn't really belong to it, but comes from inside me. The topic of this episode, the other, that which, in comparison to ourselves, seems unlike, seems alien, which appears to be separated or distant from our own nature coming from a place somehow beyond. I want to offer some reflections on how, perhaps, the relationship to the other shifts and alters 
as we transition between domains of experience that we might describe as psychological or magical and paranormal or spiritual. A phobia like my phobia of spiders maybe could be taken as presenting us with one of the ways that otherness appears within the psychological realm. Spiders, although when I'm in the grip of my phobia I'd be loath to admit it, are a legitimate part of the natural world. And so, of course, are all the other things that people can have phobias about, whether it's snakes or birds or elevators or bridges. But in the grip of that phobia, they become something that we seek to separate ourselves from at all costs. If we were truly separated from something, perhaps, then we simply wouldn't be aware of it. But that's very, very far from the case in phobia. What we're terrified of actually exerts a kind of fascination. H.P. Lovecraft is someone I tend to think of as a quite phobic writer. Apparently, since his early years, Lovecraft had a horror of the sea and all the sorts of creatures that live in the sea. Friends reported how he had a physical revulsion to fish and seafood. And yet, again and again throughout his writings, the monsters that haunt them are often slimy and tentacled and have marine attributes. If he truly hated things like that, he could have left them well alone. But instead, these aquatic monstrosities have become one of the things most strongly associated with Lovecraft. Phobia, perhaps, follows a certain paradoxical trajectory. It's as if something that's a perfectly legitimate part of the world suddenly has a burden of horror and revulsion piled up on top of it by ourselves. Yet by doing that, we only bind ourselves to it all the more. Because the more we hate something, the less we can avoid it commanding our attention. On the psychological level, it's almost as if the other becomes the other because we have made it so. And its becoming other is a way of it grabbing our attention rather than evading it. And it does this by taking on qualities that in reality it doesn't really have. On the psychological level, the other becomes the other by taking on a false appearance. Of course, the other doesn't only make its appearance in the psychological realm, in the context of fear, but also in the context of desire. And I very much doubt there is anyone listening to this who hasn't at one time found themselves completely falling for somebody, only to discover that the person they've fallen for is a false appearance projected from inside ourselves onto that person who happens to be really there. The other, that which we set ourselves against. It's a very fluid role. It can be occupied by all sorts of different things. Objects of hatred and fascination, figures that represent authority or cultural difference, and also figures or entities that represent our ideals. And as objects of desire, even our lovers, even those with whom we have the most intimate relationships, can come to occupy this role for us of a significant other. Yet very often, even in these most intimate of relationships, this dynamic is present, whereby what we're relating to is a false appearance, something not actually there, but generated inside ourselves and projected outwards onto the person we become fixated upon. I used to be a very rational, cerebral kind of creature. When I went to university, for the first time in my life, 
I became rather fascinated with what appeared to me to be the mysteries of femininity. I was very taken in by the notion of how women seemed more in touch with the emotional side of life and the mysterious and I became very aware of the power and the strength that this seemed to grant women but when I look back now it makes me smile what was really playing itself out there I think was the first inkling of the existence of those qualities of emotionality and spirituality within myself. At that age, I found those qualities incredibly desirable in other people. But really, what I was encountering were attributes that, although I didn't suspect it at the time, were actually latent within myself. I remember at that time I was totally blown away by that passage towards the end of James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, where the hero, Stephen Dedalus, while he's in effect paddling out in the sea, he meets an attractive young woman and he has this ecstatic moment, a kind of epiphany, a kind of vision, in which this girl becomes for him the apotheosis of mortal beauty who determines his future career as an artist. When I read that passage now, it strikes me as a little bit overwritten, maybe. There's that feeling here, as there is throughout the novel, that what Joyce is doing is partly poking fun at his younger self. But in any case, that girl in this passage, I think... She's a very vivid example of an archetype that Jung describes, the anima, or the animus. This is a figure that appears in dreams, where it can represent to us what's going on in our own unconscious. And Jung noted how often, in the case of a male dreamer, the figure would be female, and in the case of a female dreamer, the figure would be male, the animus. In everyday life, sometimes figures of the opposite sex can become the host of the projection of our anima or animus onto them. So the qualities that are currently latent and unconscious in ourselves assume the false appearance of belonging to people in the outside world. The emotionality and mystery and spirituality that I was projecting onto female figures were actually qualities in me. Sometimes I've come across women who similarly seem to project qualities of power, authority and knowledge onto men. I'm not suggesting that men don't have perhaps more than their fair share of access to power, authority and knowledge. But those don't proceed necessarily from being male, I think. Therein lies the difference. That's where you can spot whether somebody is projecting their anima or animus. Where there's this sense that whatever qualities are being fixated upon person who desires them couldn't possibly have those qualities themselves and yet the person they've projected those qualities upon can't possibly be without those qualities because somehow those qualities are part of their essential nature. Once upon a time it seemed an absolute certainty to me that I could never be in touch with my emotions and the mystery at the centre of things because I wasn't female. Important and valuable parts of us can really get lost when we fall into this type of projection. Sometimes this dynamic becomes part of a really effective tactic for getting rid of conflicts within ourselves that we really don't want to deal with. But there's a paradox here as well. When we project latent parts of ourselves onto others, 
although that seems to situate those parts in the other person, what gives the game away, <laughs> nevertheless, is that we recognise those parts there. It takes one to know one. Only if, at some level, we have the capacity for those parts in ourselves, is it possible to project them in the first place. So, let's take stock for a moment. On the psychological level, the other can come to occupy all sorts of different forms. And our relationship to the other, across all the various forms it might take, whether this involves hatred and fear on the one hand, or love and desire on the other, it's often about coming to grips with the possibility of a false appearance. What we see in the other could be just a projected part of ourselves. Spiders, it turns out, are just spiders. Men are just men, women are just women. Sometimes what we think we see in them is actually just a part of us. In the domain of magical and paranormal experience, suddenly the sense of the other and the type of relationship we have with it, it shifts dramatically. There's no longer the sense of the other being a bit of an illusion, a bit of a non-entity that's only populated with qualities that we place in it. Suddenly that all flips around and in a paranormal or magical experience the other becomes instead something that feels suddenly very real indeed. Something real in its own right that we suddenly realise is actually staring back at us. Suddenly it's us and our assumptions about the world and about reality and our so-called normal everyday experience. Suddenly all of that beneath the gaze of this magical paranormal other, all of that instead stands exposed as a false appearance. By way of an example, this is my favourite ever story of a bizarre coincidence. One day, a man by the name of Jason Pegler was walking down a street in his hometown and a phone box starts to ring. Usually he would have ignored this, but for some reason he felt drawn to answer this public telephone. And a voice at the other end says, Oh, hi Jason, sorry to bother you at home, but I wondered if you could help me fix the fax machine. The woman who's speaking he immediately recognises as a colleague from work, named Sue. When he tells Sue that he's not at home, but was walking along the road and is currently in a phone box, she just refuses to believe him, so he helps her with her problem with the facts. And while they're speaking, suddenly Sue goes a bit quiet because she realises what she's done. She realises that she hasn't phoned Jason's home phone number at all that has accidentally dialed his payroll number, which was next to his name on the document she was getting the information from. Now, of course, it's perfectly reasonable to attribute this simply to coincidence. What else can it be? But what I'm focusing on here is the experiential dimension of that story. Imagine that you're Jason in that story. What is that experience going to be like for you? Of course you can rationalise it, but what you would very probably be rationalising in that instance is a very strong sensation that something weird, something bizarre had happened. And the form that that weirdness and bizarreness would very probably take would be a strong sensation that something had arranged for this to happen, that somehow something, who knows what, something weird, something other, 
had somehow arranged for Jason and Sue to have that conversation. And in order for it to do that, it would have to be able to see both of them, to know exactly where each of them was, to be intimately embedded also in their mental processes, somehow giving Jason a nudge to answer that phone, whereas ordinarily he wouldn't have, and somehow giving Sue a nudge to dial the payroll number rather than the actual number, as presumably she'd done many times before. In some ways, this is a pretty mundane and inconsequential story, but that's one of my reasons for choosing it as an example, because it seems to me to illustrate so well how, even in the midst of everyday circumstances, sometimes that sense and relationship to the other can suddenly shift. Suddenly it's as if we're catapulted right out of the everyday range of things the other can present itself as, into this sense of a wholly transcendental other, an other completely beyond comprehension, which includes within the matrix of that experience not only us becoming aware of it, but also, and this is the the creepy element perhaps, a very strong sense also that it sees and knows us. It is something very real indeed, although perhaps in ways that we feel we can't possibly understand. Many different kinds of magical and paranormal experiences share this dynamic of the shift in the presentation of the other. A precognitive dream, for example, can leave us with a sense that the dream has been given or shown to us by something. The appearance of what seems to be a ghost, or in a magical context, if we evoke some kind of spirit into a triangle of art. These create that same sense of an eruption into our everyday reality of another coming from some different place altogether, which is aware of us as much as we are aware of it. The difference between what I'm calling a paranormal experience and a magical experience is maybe simply the presence of a conscious intention. Someone I met once, a practicing magician, she described how she'd lost contact with somebody and wanted to connect with them again, but she no longer had their phone number. She had a pretty good idea of what city they were probably in. So, as a last resort, (laughs) to get the rest of the number, she drew some tarot cards and took the numbers from whatever cards came up. When she dialed the number and was told by the person who answered that the person she was seeking wasn't there, she wasn't altogether surprised. It turned out that the guy she was wanting to contact actually lived next door and the person who'd picked up the phone was happy to go and get him if she was okay to wait. There's a lot of similarity between this story and the previous one we considered. The only difference that makes one of them an act of magic is indeed the intentionality. But, as magicians, even though we perform a ritual to arrive at the result, and that ritual has a conscious intention behind it, speaking personally at least, I think when something like this happens, there's still a very strong sense that it's not really us doing that, it's not really us causing that, but actually something, something other than us, beyond comprehension, arranging for what we want to take place. Now, as we just start to pivot and begin to start to think about 
how the other might shift and our relationship to it as we approach the domain of spiritual experience. I wanted to approach this from the side of magical and paranormal experience because from that direction, on the way, something curious, something puzzling seems to arise. The types of paranormal and magical experience that we've considered so far have all been, relatively speaking, straightforward. But sometimes people report experiences over an extended length of time where the level of weirdness seems to be notched up to the max. I'm thinking of so-called high weirdness cases where all kinds of paranormal phenomena that usually we might think of as being distinct seem to get lumped together all in one and hit the fan all at the same time. I don't know, suppose somebody experiences some kind of synchronicity that leads them to a particular place and then when they go and visit that place they see a ghost which then somehow morphs into Bigfoot and suddenly a UFO lands and Bigfoot climbs into the UFO and flies away. That's a bit of a facetious illustration, but cases, experiences similar to that have occurred. The classic examples being Skinwalker Ranch and John Keel's The Mothman Prophecies. What I want to focus on here is not so much the nature of the phenomena in these high weirdness cases, but the kind of approach sometimes taken by people who have investigated them. If somebody sees a ghost that turns into Bigfoot who climbs into a UFO and flies away, then evidently there is more to ghosts, Bigfoot, and UFOs than meets the eye. Bigfoot obviously isn't just some as yet undiscovered type of animal, and ghosts obviously aren't simply spirits of the dead, and UFOs acting as a taxi service to Bigfoot would presumably have more to them than what we would expect from simple visitors from another planet we find ourselves in a realm of total craziness. And it's almost as if we're back in that psychological realm, grappling with false appearances, rather than the paranormal and magical realm, where the other presents itself in experience as something more startlingly veridical and real. Understandably, in these high weirdness cases where all sorts of phenomena are mixed up together, Investigators have found themselves reaching for explanations that tend towards an assumption that the paranormal other is indeed necessarily some sort of false appearance. John Keel, in The Mothman Prophecies, for instance, posits the idea of ultra-terrestrials, some kinds of being from some kind of alternative dimension, positioned above our own in some sense, that enables them to dip in and out of our reality, our time and space, in ways that seem impossible or contradictory to us. And Colm Kelleher and George Knapp, the authors of the classic book on the Skinwalker Ranch case, they write about how it was never possible to gather any objective scientific evidence for the phenomena, because the phenomena itself seemed aware of what the investigators were trying to do and would sabotage their attempts. How would it be possible to measure or record a phenomenon if that phenomenon were conscious, intelligent, and didn't want to be measured? This might in some ways seem a perfectly reasonable approach to take, a perfectly reasonable hypothesis given 
the craziness of the phenomena that's being encountered in these high weirdness cases. But actually, what's happening here? My sense is that at this point, a kind of bifurcation is taking place in the type of relationship that's possible with the other. I think it's wonderfully well summed up in the movie version of The Mothman Prophecies, directed by Mark Pellington and released in 2002. There's a scene where the hero, played by Richard Gere, and a paranormal expert, played by Alan Bates, they're walking down a road together, and the hero is wondering how he can be receiving these strange communications about things that are going to happen in the future and turn out to be true. If there was a car crash ten blocks away, says Alan Bates's character, then that window washer up there would probably see it. Now that doesn't mean he's God or even smarter than we are, but from where he's sitting, he can see a little further down the road. The idea that's being suggested here, an idea that I've noticed often gets suggested as a potential hypothesis to account for high strangeness cases is that the other, perhaps, isn't necessarily all that different from ourselves. Maybe that sense of something beyond us doesn't necessarily indicate something in its nature fundamentally different from us, but instead something that may have simply a different relationship or perspective upon reality from our own. But the problem with this, of course, is that if the other is perhaps not all that different from us, if the other is conscious in a way similar to how we are, if the other is intelligent in a way similar to how we are, if it has a will that it seems to express like we do, then actually it's not really very other at all. My sense is that perhaps there's a kind of trap here. Perhaps what's happened is rather than accepting the other as other, it's possible to fall into the trap of looking for the other of the other. And, of course, the other of the other, <laughs> logically speaking, if logic can be said to apply here, is ourselves. Where we arrive with this is just another version of us, a kind of double, only in some other kind of place. In my experience, there's something very tricksterish about this realm. There's a kind of challenge here, maybe, a kind of test. That's how it can appear. And if we let it, this tricksterish domain will lead us around and around, presenting us with an illusory double of ourselves that never quite <laughs> seems to manifest, but leads us on again and again. And we might even waste our lives following it in pointless circles around and around. Yet also, in this domain, I think it's possible to glimpse the possibility of another shift in the way the other presents itself and in how we relate to it. There have been times when I felt very drawn to this domain and made some attempts to see if I could draw down experiences of high strangeness into my life. On a few occasions, I actually undertook magical workings to see if I could intentionally undergo some kind of alien abduction experience, just to, to see what it was like. Whenever I've tried this, something odd and unexpected has happened, and I'll give a couple of examples. So once I remember setting an intention to be abducted by aliens, 
and then I went to bed and there were some interesting dreams but nothing out of the ordinary happened. No alien greys appeared during the night except the next morning when I opened the front door and stepped out to go to work. There, lying on the front doorstep, looking suspiciously as if it had been placed there, was an empty packet of snacks. A type of snack called at the time Space Raiders. And staring up at me from the ground on the front of this empty snack packet was the face of a grey alien. Another time, myself and my magical colleague Alan Chapman One afternoon we made contact with an entity that purported to be an extraterrestrial aboard a flying saucer. We were communicating with this entity via the Ouija board and it was making all the usual kinds of claims that it was going to reveal itself to us, but none of this quite (laughs) seemed to come to pass. And that evening, as we sat talking... Suddenly, through the window, this strange, silent, hovering light in the sky appeared, a kind of pale orange in colour. At first we thought it was the planet Mars, but it soon became apparent that it was moving. A couple of days later, it was revealed in the local press that there had been a wave of reports of UFO sightings that evening across the county all across Sussex but what also became apparent was that these sightings were occasioned by the release of sky lanterns from a number of celebrations during that weekend what struck me about the results of these two workings and there were other similar ones was how they both seemed to present a result and yet not in the way that might be expected (laughs) when I found that crisp packet on the step the following morning when Alan and I asked the pilot of that UFO to present itself and were later presented with a mysterious object floating in the sky and a whole wave of sightings but sightings that were obviously fake There was very much a sense in these experiences of something playing around with us. It was almost as if the aliens were going out of their way to demonstrate to us that they didn't exist. I asked to be abducted and all I got was a crisp packet. We asked to see a UFO and all we got was a wave of obviously misperceived sky lanterns. It felt to me as if something was going out of its way to point out to me its fictionality, its insubstantiality, the fact that it didn't exist in the way that I might prefer to suppose that it did. So, in cases of high weirdness, and maybe in other kinds of experiences too, such as in magical workings where, by whatever means, somehow we've managed to really open ourselves up to the weird, then it seems that the other and our relationship to it can shift in one of at least two ways. On the one hand, we might find ourselves impelled to seek the other of the other, some kind of unifying hypothesis that gives an account of the bewildering array of forms that the other simply in itself appears to take. Yet, what that seems to achieve is the consolidation of something that generally seems pretty much like us. In the field of UFO research, the extraterrestrial hypothesis is another instance of this, perhaps. UFOs present in a bewildering variety of forms across all sorts of diverse experiences. But if we assume that the other of the other in this context is extraterrestrials, in the sense of flesh and blood, aliens travelling here 
materially from other worlds, then in many respects that other is really pretty much like us. But (laughs) the extraterrestrials that I had the experience of seeming to encounter through those magical workings were something very different and something that completely eluded conceptualization. The trickster archetype seemed very much at work. They seemed a very odd paradox indeed. On the one hand, barely substantial. The traces of them were barely enough to sustain any credence in them whatsoever. And yet, at the same time, if those synchronicities of the UFO sightings over Sussex and the packet of crisps on the step were to be taken at face value. Then at the same time there was that usual sense emanating from the paranormal other of some kind of immensely powerful entity with the ability to shape and coordinate reality. On the one hand we arrive here at an experience of the other that's totally empty. It's something beyond materiality. It doesn't exist. And yet, somehow, on the other hand, it seems to be having palpable effects upon our experience. This, I think, is the gateway to the spiritual domain of experience and to the relationship, the sense of the other that obtains in this domain of experience. In spirituality, the other ceases to exist, and yet, at the same time, intensely paradoxically, is experienced as immediately present. If the other (laughs) vanishes, then really, whatever it was that we formally set against the other that, in a sense, vanishes too. If the other doesn't exist, then it doesn't really make any sense to talk about the self continuing to exist in the same way either. Just as, in the spiritual domain, the other doesn't exist, and yet palpably continues to present itself through the impact it has on our experience, so the self takes on a similar appearance. If there's no other, then how can it possibly be said to exist? And yet, there it is, a sense of it anyway, within our experience, palpably doing its thing. And indeed, everything does just go on doing its thing. We may also very well go on seeking and trying to find the other of the other. If it's not about extraterrestrials, we might think, then maybe it's about government conspiracies. And if it's not about that, maybe it's about some sort of spiritual experience. And if it's not about that, maybe it's about just being a good person and living our lives in one way or another way. If we've had experiences in this domain, if we've experienced that vanishing of the other, then we may go on and on trying to make another of the other. And maybe we might even succeed in shutting that experience down and finding something again that we can centre ourselves around. But if it seems that we've done that, I think what's actually happened is we've returned to the psychological realm. And once again, whatever solid centre we think we've attained is really just the projection of our own desires and fears. And we've come back to this place because of the logic of where seeking the other of the other takes us. Because the other of the other is always only another version of, or the double of, or just more of the self, a false appearance, in other words. So, we have come to the end. This is the last episode in the podcast series, Occult Experiments in the Home. The aim 
of the series was always about me looking back and talking about my experiences and using those as a means for reflecting on magic, the paranormal and spirituality. But because it's been so based in personal experiences, that was always going to be finite. It was always going to come to an end at some point, and I feel as if I've reached that point now. I've talked about pretty much all the experiences that I've had, and it's difficult to think where I can go in this same vein without just repeating myself, which I fear I may already have done to a certain extent. I've saved this episode on the other for last, because, in a way, maybe it offers a kind of coda for the series as a whole. I've talked about how the sense of the other seems to shift between the realms of psychology and of magic and the paranormal and of spirituality. And the shifts I've described here are also, at the same time, a description of the trajectory that I've travelled along. I started with an interest in psychology and that took me into magic and the occult and paranormal experience and from there that was my route into spirituality and the notion of awakening. What I've talked about today is a kind of recapitulation of the personal journey that I've made. I imagine that if you've been interested enough to listen to this or any of the other episodes, then you're here because, like me, you share that fascination with the other. I've certainly always had a sense that there's something beyond all of this, and I've spent my life really yearning for that and trying to find ways to investigate it and draw it closer. Thank you for listening. My aim is to keep on making podcasts, but the direction will be changing from this point and hopefully a new podcast will be coming along. And I've also recently started making podcasts with my magical colleague of old, Alan Chapman. We've done a couple of episodes so far of a series called Warp FM, W-O-R-P-F-M. As ever, the fact that I'm able to do any of this rests entirely upon the kindness and generosity of supporters, for which I'm very, very grateful. So if you feel moved to support what I'm doing, then you can find out more at patreon.com slash oeith. There are some links in the notes as well if Patreon's not your thing and you might like instead to just send a one-off donation. Or alternatively, you might like to buy me a lovely book. And very special thanks to Ben and to Katie who did that recently. Thanks so much for the books that both of you sent. It was really lovely, really nice. Thank you. So... My lovely, thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. Take care, look after yourself, and I hope whatever I manage to produce in the future proves interesting to you in some way as well. Take care. Bye-bye.